Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. So today's video, we're gonna talk about some tips, tricks for operating compact tractor. And this is a topic I've wanted to cover for a long time. Uh, there's a lot of folks that are new to compact tractors, um, making content on YouTube or just watching YouTube. And I think this is a really good audience to go into some of this stuff. I've been using equipment and tractors for about 30 years and uh, made plenty of mistakes along the way. I learned a lot from uh, farmers and other folks uh, who had a lot of knowledge to pass on to me and I thought this would be a great opportunity to start passing uh, that on to, to to others so stick around and we'll get started okay so I think the first topic I want to cover is uh, just basic tractor safety you know tractors are just really useful tools they can they can really make you know, multiply your, your efforts when you're working on a property and doing logging and land improvements and grading, putting in driveways, putting in landscaping. So they're wonderful tools to, you know, uh, increase your productivity and make life easier on you, you know, less, less physical work, more work for the tractor. Um, but they are extremely dangerous. And, and, you know, if you've ever grown up in a farm community, you know, tractor accidents happen all the time. Um, it's just a common thing. And, we can learn a lot from that farm farm community, those folks. Uh, over the years, tractors have gotten safer. Uh, manufacturers have put features into the tractors to make them safer. And, and our, we've just gotten smarter about how we should and shouldn't operate tractors. And, uh, you know, it's important to understand a, a lot of those lessons that, that we've learned over the years. Um, tractors will roll over very easily. And so, you know, number one on the list of tips and tricks is to always think about stability and balance with your tractor. Okay, and that, that comes into play um, a bunch of different ways. But, um, uh, you know, we can start by thinking about how the tractor is going to be in contact with the ground. Um, I mean, that's, that's your ultimate goal is pretty much always stay in contact with the ground. When you lose contact with the ground, that's when things uh, go wrong. But really step one on the safety list is to take advantage of the ROPS or the rollover protection system on your tractor. Um, when all else fails, this is going to protect you in the event of a rollover. Uh, but for this to work effectively, it needs to be up and it locked, locked into the, the upright position. So make sure you've got that done. Um, you know, there are situations where you can make a calculated risk that you're not going to need ROPS like mowing a flat field. But if you're doing anything on a hill, anywhere there's ditches that you can roll into, anywhere where the ground is soft, um, you know, just put the ROPS up, okay? It's, it's a little bit extra insurance and, and it will uh, make things a whole lot safer. And in conjunction with that, use your seatbelt because the ROPS is really only gonna function if you can stay uh, contained in this rollover protection zone uh, within the ROPS, uh, you know, footprint, uh, let's say so. You know, take advantage of that seat belt. It's going to help the ROPS protect you in the event of a rollover. Um, so that's kind of the the ultimate. You know, if all else fails, we count on the ROPS. But before that comes into play, you really want to think about stability on the ground and balance. And uh, you know, that's going to come basically down to uh, keeping contact with the ground with with the tractor wheels and. Um, most people think about issues of rollovers on hills, and you know it's pretty simple on a hill. If if some part of the tractor's center gravity gets outside of the the resisting footprint of the wheels, the tractor's going to want to tip over. Um, and so you know you don't want to be running sideways on a hill. You know that's that's increasing your rollover risk dramatically. If you have to operate on hills, go up and down the hill. Um, but you can have a rollover risk on flat ground, and that surprises a lot of people. But I will tell you personally, the only time I have come close to feeling my tractor get tippy was on perfectly flat ground when one of the rear tires dropped into a very soft, muddy rut, okay? And that's all it took to upset the balance of the tractor and to give me the sensation that, uh, you know, any minute now that thing could tip and, and luckily I was able to react very quickly but you know that can happen on flat ground so just keep that in mind you don't have to be on hills to uh, cause an instability problem with your tractor you really just need to be in a situation where one wheel is going to dip 
uh, far enough below the other uh, that the weight of the tractor gets outside of that footprint of the wheels and the tractor can go over. So uh, just remember that. Now in terms of what resists rollover on a tractor, um, there, there are two key factors and this goes back to just simple physics, okay? Uh, the first is your weight distribution, you know, where, you, where your weight is, how it's spread out relative to the wheels, how high it is, how low it is. Um, and, and so that's important. Uh, the second will be the width of your wheels in terms of, you know, sideways rollovers. The wider your wheels, the more stable of a base you're going to have. And most of the stability gains to be had with tractor wheels are going to happen on the rear wheels. The fronts, if you look at pretty much every compact tractor on the market today, that front axle is actually on a pivot. It's attached at the center and it pivots. And so your front axle is not going to give you any resisting uh, forces or any initial stability when it comes to a rollover scenario. If you roll over far enough that the axle pivots and hits a stop, well, then it can help you. But in a lot of cases, that's too late. So it's really the rear wheels, what they're doing, how wide they are, what the track is of the tractor. That's your primary uh, resistance against rollovers. And so, you know, if you're going to do things like widening your, your rear track on your tractor, some, some tractors you can flip the rims, uh, other tractors you can get uh, wider uh, mounted rims. Um, you know, the, the rear wheels are where all that's going to come into play. So just remember that in terms of stability, both what you can do to promote it and what can go wrong if you lose it. Most of that is happening here on the rear axle and the rear wheels. Okay, so that's that's one important thing to think of. But let's say you've done everything you can to maximize the stability of your tractor. Uh, you've got wheels set wide. You know you're operating within a range that's um, safe and practical for that tractor. The next important thing is going to be your weight distribution. And uh, really, the simplest concept there is you want to keep your weight low. Keep it down to the ground. And one of the probably worst offenses I see on YouTube is people driving around with their tractor bucket up in the air. And um, empty or loaded, it doesn't matter. This should not be up in the air while you're driving around. Now, if you need to maneuver in a tight space, okay, lift it up, make your maneuver and put it back down. But I've seen pictures of people mowing fields or doing grading work and they're driving around with their bucket up in the air. And that is one of the dumbest and worst things you can do to reduce the stability of your tractor. And I'm not talking about a little bit of reduction. I'm talking about a huge reduction because loaders tend to be, you know, uh, hundreds or a uh, couple thousand pounds of weight. Um, and these can go up eight to 10 feet high. You put something like that way up in the air, um, all of a sudden that's a big ballast that's just hanging up there like a flag and you get into any sort of a tipping situation that will amplify all of those rollover effects, you know, tenfold in, in some cases. So for God's sakes, you know, if you're driving around, keep your loader down low. Um, there's really never a reason to raise it up high. If you think there's a reason to raise it up high and drive around, chances are you'd be better off removing the loader from your tractor or removing the bucket from the loader. Okay. And those could be issues where you might need visibility or you not, might need to move or in, maneuver in tight places. Well, you know, think about it. Just, just take the loader off the tractor. If that's going to be something that you're doing a lot, that's telling you the loader isn't really important for that type of work. So, you know, just keep this thing down low as, as, as much as possible. Um, and then the other thing, you know, that can, that same effect can, can happen back here on the three point hitch. You know, we put a lot of heavy implements on tractors. They hang out in, in many cases, uh, uh, good distance from the tractor. Same darn thing can have, can happen back there. You want to think about your weight back there. Anything that's far away from the axles of the tractor can lead to instability. So, uh, same goes back there, you know, in, in a situation where stability is going to be important. You want your influence back there to, to be hanging low, uh, not up in the air. Uh, really, one of the, the worst offenders for stability on the back of the tractor is a backhoe. Uh, they're even heavier than front loaders. They're even taller. You know, typically when you're stowing a backhoe, you're driving around with it, you know, folded in, curled in, and sticking up in the air. And uh, that's a lot of weight to have on the back of a tractor 
in any situation where rollovers can happen. So just be very cautious um, when, when you're uh, operating with a, a backhoe on the back of the tractor. Okay, so we've talked about uh, stability and balance in terms basically of the, the tractor itself and the wheels and the terrain. Um, but uh, there's also an issue of stability and balance and really ballast that comes into play when doing front loader operations. And as we mentioned earlier, you know, these loaders weigh hundreds or thousands of pounds. They put a lot of weight on the front end of the tractor. And if you want to think of this tractor and the wheels as, as teeter totters balancing about these, these two points, when you put a lot of weight on the front of the tractor, it's gonna tip that balance about your front axles and it's gonna lighten uh, the ground force basically on the back of the tractor, okay? So if you put a front loader on your tractor, it's very important to have ballast in the rear of the tractor. And uh, just to offset the loader itself, let's say the empty loader, uh, what a lot of people will do is put uh, liquid in their rear tires. I have uh, washer fluid in my tires. You can get rim guard, which is beet juice. Uh, if you live somewhere where it doesn't freeze, you can just stick water in there. Uh, you know, in the old days, they would put calcium chloride in the tires because it was very heavy uh, liquid, but uh, that wants to corrode things out. So you want to try and stick with something that's, you know, going to be safe for your wheels and for the environment. Um, but by putting fluid in the rear of the tires, you're bringing some weight back down uh, to the back of the tractor. You're going to help keep the, the back of the tractor planted and offset the, the weight of adding that front loader. But that really is only there to enhance the static stability of the tractor uh, against the weight of that putting that loader on. If you now start to pick up really heavy objects in your front loader, you're going to need additional ballast. And I think a lot of people forget that or don't know about it. They think they've loaded their tires and they're good to go. Uh, the problem with that is if you want to think about putting a heavy weight up in your front bucket, okay, um, with a heavy enough weight, this becomes the pivot point, and uh, it's going to want to lighten the, the ground force on your, your rear tires, possibly even lift them off the ground. I'm, I'm sure we've all, all done that before. Um, and when you load the tires, it could bring this back down, but this is still going to act as the pivot point, okay? If you truly want to ballast the tractor, you need to bring these tires back down and make the rear tires act as the pivot point. And the only way to do that is to put your ballast behind the rear axle. And a convenient way to do it is gonna be on the three-point hitch. And so just remember that ballast or wheel weights, they will help keep the back end planted, but they are not going to take load off of the front axle uh, that you're creating by putting something in your front loader. To do that, you absolutely need to have your ballast behind the rear axle and then force this to become a pivot point again uh, for the weight balance of the tractor. So um, when I'm doing any sort of, um, I'd say medium lifting, stuff up to maybe uh, 800 or 1,000 pounds, I'll usually just count, you know, whatever implement I have on the back of the tractor as my ballast. Um, you know, this is a box blade. I think this is maybe about four to 500 pounds. And if you look at the lever arm between the front axle and this, that's a really long lever arm, okay, compared to the lever arm between the front axle and that. And so, you know, even just having four or 500 pounds back here is really good amount of ballast to, uh, you know, get things back to where they need to be, keep the rear wheels planted, take some load off of the front axle. Front axles are not really meant to handle the full brunt of your loader. And so ballast back here is going to put things uh, uh, back into an overall balance where the rear wheels now start to share some of the load uh, from that front loader and you're not putting a whole lot of stress only on that front axle. So uh, typically I'll pull my box blade out, you know, for, uh, it happens to be on a tractor a lot anyway, so this is kind of my go-to everyday ballast. But if I have to lift something really heavy, um, let's say a thousand pounds or above, then I have a dedicated ballast box I can put on the tractor. That weighs, uh, I think that weighs about 950 pounds. I'll, I'll show a video clip of it. Um, it's filled with concrete, it's filled with old lead, old steel scrap, it, it's heavy. One of the benefits of the ballast box is that it's smaller, it's closer into the tractor, it's easier to maneuver if you're driving around, you know, than having say a box blade or a mower or a backhoe hanging off. You can get a ballast box, they tend to be compact and they're in closer 
And so, you know, if I'm lifting everything heavy and, and this tractor can lift up to about 2,700 pounds down low, uh, for sure I go get that ballast box. And you think about having, you know, 900 pounds lever, lever armed over to this point versus what's up there. That adds a very good counterweight to the back of the tractor. And again, we'll take the load um, off of that front axle. So I really can't say enough about ballast. Uh, you know, again, load your tires if you're putting a loader on the tractor. That will, that's your first step to, to getting things back to, you know, putting some ground force on your rear tires. But think about the payload that's going to go in that front loader. Anytime you're lifting anything heavy, you really want to have additional ballast uh, back here on the three-point hitch so that it's hanging behind the rear axle line. Okay, so now I want to talk about brakes. And, you know, as we go through this information, we're kind of building up a pyramid or a hierarchy of different effects that uh, go into stability on the tractor. You know, we've talked about the, the balance and, and the weight. Uh, we talked about ballast. And kind of what goes hand in hand with, with ballast and, and you're keeping your rear wheels on the ground is the braking of the tractor. And not a lot of people realize that the tractor doesn't have brakes on the wheels. It actually just has a single brake that's inside the transmission, usually on the transmission output shaft. So if you have a two-wheel drive tractor or you have a four-wheel drive tractor, but you're only operating in a two-wheel drive mode, uh, you only have brakes on the rear axle. Okay, nothing's happening up front. And so uh, a very common dangerous situation people get into with tractors is they'll put something heavy in their front bucket they won't have enough ballast on the rear of the tractor. They'll drive down a hill or they'll, they'll drive on some slippery terrain like maybe wet grass and they'll go to step on the brakes. And because uh, the rear wheels are not in good contact with the ground, they don't have a lot of traction and you don't get any braking. And I've heard people describe it as their brakes failing, but um, I've actually seen this happen to somebody their rear wheels were locked up and they were just dragging along the ground. And so if you, when you go back in these situations and you try and see what happened, you'll usually see skid marks from the rear wheels just dragging along the ground. And, uh, you know, the brakes are doing their job. They're locking up the rear axle. But if the wheels are not in good contact with the ground, you're not going to get an overall braking effect on the tractor. And so, you know, very important thing to realize is that in two wheel drive scenarios, you only have brakes on the rear axle and the braking action uh, of the brake system is only gonna be as good as the amount of traction you have on the ground with your rear tires. And so, you know, we can go back to talking about weight and balance and ballast. Uh, this is another reason why you wanna have good ballast on the rear of your tractor when you're carrying something in the front loader. You wanna keep these wheels planted so that if you do need to hit the brakes, uh, the tires can actually dig in and do something. Uh, but the second thing you can do and really probably one of the best things you can do if you have a four-wheel drive tractor is to engage the front wheels. When you do that, they are now locked into the drive line and uh, they will be handled by that brake that's inside the transmission so that when you step on the brake pedal, when you, when you, you break that transmission output shaft, now that braking effect is being transmitted through all, all the wheels on the tractor, rear and front. And so, um, you know, my, my rule of thumb is if I'm operating on a hill, in any situation, four-wheel drive it gets engaged, okay? Uh, you know, you just never know what's gonna happen when you need to hit the brakes. Um, if you're on a hill, uh, you know, you're gonna want brakes on all four wheels, so please, you know, engage four-wheel drive if you're operating on a hill and you need to use your brakes. If there's any situation where the ground is slippery, uh, that could be wet turf, uh, you know, you might not even think wet turf is a big deal to a, a big, you know, tough tractor like this, but that's one of those situations where it can make the ground very greasy. Um, one of the worst situations I've ever run into was in the middle of winter when we had a hard freeze, the ground was frozen, and then we had a warm day and the top two inches of soil thawed out, and that was extremely slippery. Uh, I've, I've never seen traction problems like I have in, in that situation. And so that would be a case where, you know, you, you have really poor braking performance. We often think of traction in terms of moving forward, but you want to think about it in terms of braking too. So if you're in any sort of situations on a hill, poor traction, slippery terrain, um, engaging four wheel drive is going to be beneficial, you know, for forward traction, but also for braking. It'll 
make your braking so much more effective by spreading that out uh, across the four wheels. So just remember that. Uh, but you know, going back to ballast, um, you know, braking and ballast go hand in hand. Uh, the, the, the better you can keep your, your rear tires in contact with the ground, uh, the better your braking is going to be on this rear axle. So, um, you know, that's a very typical situation. If you got something heavy in the front loader, you're going to get light on the rear end. You could lose your brakes um, and, and that could be a big problem. So, you know, when you're thinking about balance and weight and ballast, think about your brakes. If you're operating in any risky conditions, engage four wheel drive so that you have braking uh, on all four tires. Okay, so now I want to talk about basic maintenance and you know, really the best information is going to be in the owner's manual for your tractor. They're going to have generally a, a list of things to do every so many hours. They're also going to have what they would call a daily checklist, things you need to check before you op operate the tractor. Some people are real religious about that. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit slack about that, but there are a couple areas I don't fool around. The first one is to check the tire pressure and this can be as simple as eyeballing the tires to make sure a tire is not flat or just getting out a pressure gauge. Uh, if you have liquid field rear tires, uh, you know, you, you want to put your, your valve stem at 12 o'clock, burp out any fluid that's in the stem before you connect your pressure gauge. But, you know, either by eyeball or with a pressure gauge, just make sure your tires are not low. Uh, a really common failure with tractors is people not paying attention, a tire gets low, and then they'll roll it right off the rim. And not only is that a real pain in the butt to deal with in terms of fixing it, because these tires, believe me, you know, if you've ever mounted tires or worked with tires, these tires are stiff, they're heavy. Uh, it's just a real chore to, to, to put these back on the rim if they slip off. So you want to avoid that, but you can get yourself into a situation, say you're out operating in the woods or you're working on a hill or you're mowing a field, you know, five miles from your house without any tools, you roll your tire off the rim, you know, that's bad news. Um, it, it, at, uh, at the very least, it could be real inconvenience, um, uh, or, you know, you, you could create a dangerous situation by losing a tire off of, of the wheel. So to me, like one of the simplest daily maintenance things you really should do is just walk around and either look at your tires or measure the pressure to, to make sure uh, it's good because, you know, you're going to be hating life uh, if you roll one of your tires uh, off of the rims. The other crazy thing that happens when you have low tire pressure on a tractor, uh, especially if you have uh, uh, filled rear tires, is that the, uh, the tire gets loose on the rim and the rim will actually spin inside the tire. So you could be going up a hill and lose traction and think, oh my God, I'm slipping, something's wrong. Uh, but it turns out because the tire pressure is low, the rim is going to spin uh, inside the tire and, you know, tires and wheels to work together, they kind of have to be connected. And so that's another thing you want to avoid uh, due to, to low tire pressure. And then the other thing I like to check is greasing the fittings on the front loader. And for this tractor, it's uh, called for every 10 hours. And I try and stick to that pretty carefully. I've seen what happens to the loader pins and the the bushings, when you don't grease adequately, they start to wallow out and, you know, five five years into your tractor ownership, you got a really sloppy front loader. So uh, it pays to keep these greased. Uh, again, I do that every 10 hours, but I do eyeball that. And so if I see, um, you know, one of these pins, uh, maybe it's got dirt in it, um, or, you know, I do a lot of work with gravel and crusher run, you know, that stuff flies around, it's very abrasive. If I see that's gotten into the grease or on a pin, I'll take a second, clean that off, re-grease it. Usually when you pump the new grease in, you're gonna push the old grease and any contaminants out. So it's not like you have to do a real uh, detailed cleaning job. You really just have to get new grease in there to push the old stuff out. And so, uh, you know, that's another thing to keep, uh, keep an eye on. Uh, other parts of the tractor, most of these tractors, you know, there's grease fittings all over the tractors for things as simple as the pedals and the controls. A lot of that stuff is done every 50 hours. Um, so it's not something you need to check daily, but it's something you want to stay on top of. Uh, it keeps everything working, working better uh, when it's greased. Um, there are different pedals on the tractor that have different safety switches. Some of those will get messed up and, you know, send you down a rabbit hole of weird troubleshooting. 
um, because you haven't greased the pedal you, and, and you know maybe a little linkage is sticking and, and either triggering or not triggering a safety switch. So you know, uh, stay on top of that stuff as well uh, on the interval called for in your owner's manual. Okay, this next bit is going to be kind of specific to people that have an HST or hydrostatic transmission on their tractor. Uh, what I've seen is that a lot of new tractor owners will try and treat their HST control uh, more like the accelerator pedal on a car or truck. And unfortunately, that's not how it's supposed to work. Uh, if you look at the way an HST transmission works, it's essentially putting a hydraulic motor between the tractor engine and the gear case or transmission of the tractor. And when you... Um, actuate the treadle or, or pedals if your tractor has pedals you're increasing the flow rate flow rate through that hydraulic motor and that has the effect of changing the gear ratio that the tractor is operating at so with the pedal up you're at a very low gear ratio if you push it all the way down you're getting to a very high gear ratio well uh, you know a lot of people will interpret this more to be about power and they'll push it all the way down thinking they're maximizing their power but really that's going to be like putting your car in fifth gear and trying to go up a hill it's just the wrong thing to do so uh, in those situations really what you want to do is use the hand throttle on your tractor to uh, raise the rpms to get the engine putting out more power and just press lightly on the hst treadle which is going to keep you in a lower effective gear ratio and that's going to put more power and 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 torque uh, down through the transmission uh, to get things done. So don't push on this like it's a gas pedal. Don't mash it. Um, that's going to usually be contrary to what you want to do. Really, the only times you're going to want to be mashing this down is, is if you're moving the tractor at a higher speed under very light loads, such as moving on the road or, you know, dragging something that has very little resistance. Uh, other times you're going to want to be operating this, these treadle controls on the lower end of, of the, the input range to keep the tractor um, in an effective uh, lower gear. Now, the other thing I want to point out is that uh, pretty much every HST tractor also has a uh, gear range selector, and there's mine over there. This, this is a three-speed tractor, so I have a high, medium, and a low. Um, a lot of tractors are two-speed. Selecting that proper gear range is also very, very um, important to the HST operation. Um, you know, I've, I've run in the people that have their tractor in high for some reason and they're mashing the, the pedal and you can hear the HST whining, you know, miles away just because it's, it's protesting, it's working really hard, it's not effective, it's just heating up the fluid basically and not effectively transmitting power. And so, you know, there's a lot of situations where you might want to drop down into your lower gear range um, to, to get things done effectively and make the most out of that HST. Really the high ranges, especially on a Kubota or a three range tractor high, the only time you're ever gonna to wanna to be using that is for uh, road transport, um, you know, on smooth surfaces. Um, overall on a Kubota, you tend to wanna to be operating in medium. And then if you're doing any pulling or, um, you know, ground engagement work uh, where there's a lot of resistance, uh, then you'll wanna drop it into low. Okay, so now if you have a front loader on your tractor, um, you know, most people understand what a front loader is for. These are really designed, you know, if you look at the hydraulics and the mechanisms and the linkages, these are designed for lifting and then curling. That's really what they're designed for. Um, a lot of people will try and use front loaders like a bulldozer, and that's where they run into problems. I've had so many neighbors break front loaders, uh, bend hydraulic cylinders, bend the loader arms, get loaders that end up being uh, cocked uh, sideways because they treat it like a bulldozer and these are not designed to be a bulldozer at all if you if you look at a bulldozer okay uh, that's meant to push on the ground and, and do grading work by pushing forward with a blade they're built entirely different than the front loader on a tractor even than the front loader on construction equipment so um, my, my best advice is don't treat your front loader like a bulldozer it's not meant for that you might be able to get away with it once in a while, but eventually you're gonna break something. And when you break parts on a front loader, uh, very rarely is it a quick, inexpensive fix. I mean, generally it's gonna be something that's gonna take your tractor out of service for a while and be hundreds or thousands of dollars. So uh, don't treat this as a bulldozer. That's really not what it's designed for.
Now, one thing you can do with your front loader that's very handy is back dragging to spread and smooth material or just to do very basic grading tasks. And done properly, back dragging works great. What I'm showing you here is the wrong way to do back dragging. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people do it the wrong way and, and, and break, break their front loader. Uh, for some reason, a lot of people, when they want to back drag, they think, well, I want to get the bucket down and get that cutting edge and back drag with that. Um, the problem is that is that that extends your, your curl uh, hydraulic cylinders and if you run into any obstacle, if you go over a bump, if you do anything uh, that puts resistance on this cutting edge as you're dragging back, you're going to bend that cylinder because in this position, you know, cil cylinders are basically made to provide a force this way and to resist force that way. They have very little strength in, in, in other directions. but if you're back dragging and you run into an immovable object, you've got the weight of the loader pushing down and then you've got this skinny cylinder hanging out. Uh, anything that's gonna trip up that bucket and make it wanna do that is probably gonna break or bend that, that cylinder. And so many people get into trouble uh, back dragging uh, with the, the loader um, in this type of, of position. So don't do that. Give me a second now. I'm going to start up the tractor and put this into the proper orientation you want to use for back dragging, and then we'll talk about that. Okay, so if you are going to be back dragging, this is how you want to do it. You want to have your cylinders fully retracted, and you want to be doing it with the heel of the bucket. And this is a rounded part of the bucket and uh, it actually works very well to be back dragging with the heel. You get nice, nice, uh, smooth results. The other thing you're probably gonna wanna do is put your front loader uh, uh, up and down adjustment into float. And most loaders will have a float detent adjustment on the lever where if you push it all the way down and then pop it forward, it's gonna go into a float mode and that's going to put the bucket on the ground. You'll get the weight of the bucket pushing down, which is really good for grading and smoothing. Uh, but the other thing it's going to do is it's going to basically uh, bypass the hydraulics on your, your up and down cylinders so that as, as you're back dragging, if you run into something, it's just going to let the bucket ride up and down. And so um, if you're going to do back dragging, and it's a great technique, um, I use it all the time, this is the position you want to get your bucket in. You want to be doing your work uh, from the heel of the bucket, and you want to be putting that front loader into float so that you're not in any danger of, of damaging anything. Okay, so just like you don't want to use your front loader as a bulldozer, you really need to be careful about what you do with your three-point hitch. And I've covered some of this in another video um, I made about how to use a box blade, and I'll put a link to that up here in the, in the corner. Uh, but in that video, I, I talk about how three-point hitches are set up basically to draw implements or to pull implements forward um, if you look at the linkages and the arrangement of the linkages and the type of mechanism a three-point hitch forms, it's really meant for pulling things forward. Uh, the three-point hitches are not intended and have a very, very little capability to push things in reverse. And so you need to be careful about that. Uh, you know, as I mentioned in that box blade video, there are ways you can angle the box blade and feather it so that when you push back, you're smoothing and there's not a heavy load on the three-point hitch. And I, I do that you know, quite a bit. Um, but you don't want to be pushing back uh, in a way that puts a really dramatic compression load into the three-point hitch. Uh, these are just not designed for that. Um, and if you push too hard on a three-point hitch in reverse, uh, really bad things can happen. Now, uh, I've unfortunately seen a lot of failures like this too. If you're lucky, you will just bend or break one of the arms or or links in the three-point hitch and you can replace that and they're they're not always cheap I mean if you were to mess up one of these lower arms beyond repair you know it's gonna be a couple hundred bucks um, but so you know if you're lucky you'll break something that's an external piece that you can replace but what I've seen unfortunately happen to a lot of people uh, because the three-point hitch is attached into the rear gear case of the tractor and that tends to be uh, a cast part which is integrated into the transmission and the axles and, and it's part of the way the tractor bolts together. Uh, if you do really extreme damage to your three-point hitch, and I'm talking about a shock or an impact, you can actually break the, the rear case of the tractor where that three-point hitch attaches in. 
Um, this is especially problematic on a lot of smaller, lighter tractors that might use cast aluminum back here. Um, when you cause that kind of damage, boy, you're talking about thousands of dollars. Uh, sometimes you can weld it back up. Uh, you're still going to have to take it off the tractor and drain the fluid and, you know, take the bearings and gears out to weld it. But in a lot of cases, you have to replace part of the gear case. And that is a very, very expensive repair. So just remember that three-point hitches are not made to push on anything hard in reverse. If you have to do anything like that, you know, do it sensibly. Look at my box blade video about using the box blade in reverse and, and, and how that can be done. Um, but for sure, don't push back uh, in, in, against anything that's immovable, um, you know, anything that's not gonna budge or, or do anything that's gonna put a heavy shock or impact load into the three-point hitch because um, it's just not made for that and uh, you can get very unlucky when, when things go wrong. Okay, one last word on a three-point hitch. There's a procedure you're gonna to wanna to follow when you're adjusting your, your sway links on the side of the hitch. And these are what control side-to-side uh, -side sway of the implement and uh, check uh, motion of the implement side-to-side. -side. Um, and I did a, a much older video about this, uh, probably four or five years ago that I'll link to. You can check that out for the full uh, procedure. Uh, it's nothing fancy, but it uh, ex explains everything pretty well. Uh, but really the upshot here is that these guys are really meant to work in tension, whether you have the uh, telescopic style like I do here or turnbuckles. Uh, they're not meant to handle compression. Um, they're meant to uh, control your sway by, uh, let's say this, this whole implement wants to sway that way. Well, this would check that by going into tension on this side before that side goes into compression. And so that's kind of a subtle type of adjustment you want to uh, put into this to make sure when you're checking your sway side to side you're doing it with one of the links going into tension not putting either of the links into compression because they're really not made to handle that so check out that old video for for more details on that procedure okay so we've talked a lot about traction already in this video uh, <clears throat> chances are you know in this day and age if you're buying a compact tractor uh, or if you own a compact tractor, it's probably going to be four-wheel drive. Uh, there are still two-wheel drive tractors out there, but they tend to be higher horsepower focused more on agricultural applications. You know, really under 60 horsepower, most of the tractors on the market now are going to be four-wheel drive. And, uh, you know, four-wheel drive is, is really great for, for, for forward traction. And I, we talked about how it's great for braking as well. Um, but just in terms of, of traction in general, uh, if I could give out one piece of advice with four-wheel drive is try and anticipate traction problems before they occur. Uh, go into four-wheel drive before traction becomes an issue and, and, and leads to, to problems because so many of the situations you run into where you might run out of forward traction, uh, the act of running out of that traction is going to take a bad situation and potentially make it worse. You know, you might end up creating a big sloppy rut. You might create a divot and a bump. Um, and those are going to exacerbate traction issues from there on out. So the best thing you can do with a four-wheel drive tractor is really try and anticipate traction problems before they happen. Take advantage of four-wheel drive and uh, use it whenever you think it makes sense. Uh, there's a flip side of that. You don't want to overuse four-wheel drive because it puts a lot of stress on your drive line. That's not so much a big deal if you're on soft surfaces or gravel or dirt. Uh, but if you're operating a lot on hard pavement, you know, you really don't want to be using four-wheel drive in that situation. But generally, those are the situations where you're not going to have traction issues and, and you probably don't need four-wheel drive. So there are going to be instances where you want to disconnect your front loader or maybe you'll have accessories on rear remotes uh, on your tractor. And um, uh, these will be plumbed in usually with some sort of uh, flexible hydraulic lines and quick, quick disconnects. Well, a problem a lot of people run into is that they will disconnect uh, these, these hydraulic hoses with pressure inside of the system. And what that does is that leaves pressurized fluid inside the hoses. And um, in the future, when you go to reconnect your loader or reconnect your implement, you can't actually push the uh, connectors back on because of that high pressure fluid inside is basically pushing on the, um, the, the, the valves in, inside of these, these uh, connects. So, uh, one trick you always want to do before you disconnect your front loader, anything on the rear remotes or even back hose on a, on, uh, on a power beyond circuit, for instance, 
uh, just go to the valve for that hydraulic circuit, you know, move it in all directions. By doing that, you're going to relieve high pressure from the lines. Um, and then it'll be safe to remove the quick disconnects and the hoses and hopefully not have problems uh, next time when you go to put things back on. If you, if you do, however, if you run into problems where you can't push on one of these fittings because of pressure in the lines, and that might occur if there was, there's been a big temperature change that you know, repressurized fluid in, in the lines, uh, what you can normally do is wrap the ends of the lines in a towel and then carefully poke through inside to the plunger uh, which has a valve there to, to hold the fluid in. Just carefully poke through with that. You might need to tap it with a hammer, uh, but you can normally just gently crack that loose and relieve the pressure. Uh, but it's very important to keep a towel over those fittings just in case any fluid uh, wants to squirt out. All right, so now I want to talk about uh, <clears throat> what to do in a couple typical scenarios where something will go wrong uh, while operating a tractor. You know, let's say you've done everything you could to make it uh, go smoothly and safely, but something goes wrong. There's a few typical things that will happen and a, a couple shortcuts that you should know in those situations. So uh, I think the first one a lot of people run into is they'll be uh, operating their tractor and it suddenly stalls or they'll go to start their tractor and it won't start. And this will come after a period of everything working just fine. And so in those situations, first, you know, look, look for the obvious things, verify that you haven't run out of fuel. If you haven't, then the next thing you want to check is going to be your safety switches. And uh, the, a modern compact tractor will have safety switches really scattered all over. Uh, this particular tractor has a safety switch on the PTO. It has two safety switches on the seat. It's got a safety switch on the clutch and then a safety switch on the HST treadle. And they're all there and they all, some of them interact with each other uh, uh, basically to keep you from doing something stupid. So for instance, if the tractor was moving and I left the seat, would kill the engine. Um, if nobody's in the seat, but the HST treadle gets depressed for forward or reverse, it'll kill the engine. Uh, it won't let me start the tractor if the PTO is engaged and, and so on. Uh, so most of those switches have a pretty good purpose, uh, but they can uh, cause problems if somehow the switch is losing contact, either due to a fault in the switch itself or the way the switch is mounting. Um, the only time I've had a problem with a safety switch on this tractor uh, was when snow got packed in and, and triggered the switch when it shouldn't have. Um, I wasted a lot of time troubleshooting that, but it turned out to be a safety switch. And in the time since, I've, I've helped a lot of neighbors deal with the same kind of problems with safety switches. So if your tractor quits out of the blue or won't start out of the blue, before you waste too much time looking at all the other things that could be wrong, check all your safety switches. Um, you know, make sure they're not blocked or stuck. Um, I've even heard people, uh, if they don't keep up with lubrication and greasing on their HST treadle, uh, sometimes that treadle won't want to return perfectly to center when they let off it. That'll trigger the safety switch. So just check your switches, check any linkages or, or mechanisms that are attached to the switches that might need lubrication or grease. And I think you might be surprised that will fix a lot of very typical scenarios where the tractor just quits or um, will not start. Um, but let's say your, your tractor quits or won't start and you determine it's because you ran out of fuel. Well, with a diesel engine, running out of fuel can be pretty pretty big deal. Um, and before you do anything, I'd say go find the owner's manual for your tractor and see if it has a section on bleeding the fuel system. Because when you run a diesel engine dry, uh, you'll end up getting air into the fuel supply system and maybe even the fuel injection system and to get that tractor started and avoid all kinds of other problems, you're probably gonna to need to bleed the system first. So if you have run out of fuel, uh, don't just fill up and try and start the tractor. Fill up and then look to see if there are any procedures you need to go through in order to bleed the system before you try and start it. Um, another one, if you're in any situation where there's a hydraulic leak, um, hydraulic leaks, you know, it's plumbing, plumbing leaks, but hydraulic leaks can actually be quite dangerous because of the high pressures involved in the systems. It could be hundreds of PSI, thousands of PSI. And when you get hydraulic fluid leaking out under that high of a pressure, uh, it can actually you know, cut, cut into your skin and flesh. Um, and if you get hydraulic fluid um, in, in, into your, uh, under your skin, that can cause really, really serious medical issues. So 
um, my advice with hydraulic leaks is back away. Okay, if you can sh safely shut everything off, great. Do that before you get anywhere near the leak. Be very wary of hydraulic leaks where fluid is shooting out. You just don't want to get your body or your hands or, or anything um, near any of those leaks. Get the tractor cut off before you get close and, and try to diagnose and, and fix the leak. And then the final thing, um, you know, w w everything we've talked about today, a lot of that had to do with avoiding rollovers, but let's say, you know, despite all that, you do have a rollover and the tractor's on its side. Uh, there's a couple things you want to do to be careful to, to recover from that situation. So, um, you know, first of all, assuming you, you've safely extricated yourself from the tractor, if the engine is still running, cut it off as soon as possible. Uh, a lot of things can, can go uh, wrong and, 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 and bad things can happen if the tractor's on its side and the engine is still running. Um, and then past that point, um, you don't just want to roll the tractor back upright and start it up. There's a lot of things you need to check before you think about starting uh, uh, the engine back up. Uh, the first thing I would say is check all your fluids, your transmission fluid, the uh, uh, water in the battery, your engine oil, your antifreeze. Some of those may have leaked, top those off as needed. And then before you even attempt to crank over the engine, what you really want to do is go to each cylinder and pull off a glow plug or a fuel injector or a fuel injection you know, supply uh, or, or um, inflow point if, if your tractor has one and make sure there is no fluid inside the cylinders. Uh, it's very typical if you roll a tractor for uh, diesel uh, um, to get into the cylinders or even engine oil, uh, both can happen. And if uh, either of those fluids get into the cylinder and, uh, and fill it up, uh, that, that creates a hydrolock condition. And if you attempt to start the tractor under that condition, you're gonna cause some really catastrophic engine damage. And it's hard to believe that just the action of turning a starter uh, could do that, but it will, you know, the fluid in there is, is incompressible. So uh, the piston's gonna run up against, uh, you know, push the fluid up and fill the, the volume of the cylinder. Uh, the starter's still cranking over and the typical failure is either a bent or a broken connecting rod. And, and you know, that's, that's a pretty, pretty serious uh, repair. So uh, you, you can go from bad to worse if you attempt to start a tractor that's been on its side or has rolled over without checking that first. So, you know, be sure to do that. Even if it was just briefly on its side, um, you know, whether the engine kept running or not, before you try and restart it, check every cylinder, make sure there's no fluid in there, make sure that engine is not hydrolocked before you attempt to start it. All right, so that's gonna wrap up today's video on uh, compact tractor operating tips and tricks. I hope this has been useful to everyone. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Uh, if you think of anything you'd like to learn more about, if there's anything I forgot, and I'm sure I did forget a few things, um, you know, let me know in the comments below and that can be a topic for a future video. Uh, otherwise, uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.